So in this video, I want to talk about the four different generations of penicillins. So the penicillins are categorized by that generation and the generation is going to tell you what kind of spectrum of activity those drugs have. So for the penicillins, we have four generations and I always like to think about them like a family. So we have generation one, which is the father, then the second generation is the mother, which is a little bit through the hair, some more bulky, bulky molecule, as you can see here. Then we have the kids, third generation, the daughter, also a little bit more bulky than the little boy here, the fourth generation. So I've listed here the most important examples of the different generations. So if you just look at these molecules, and these are obviously just approximate drawings here, what can we predict? So one concern when we are talking about penicillins is always the production of penicillinases, or we can also say beta-lactamases that are produced by bacteria. So as we know, a lot of bacteria are able to produce enzymes that, that can destroy the beta-lactam ring. And this is obviously a major resistant problem. So if you look at these molecules, we can figure out if this specific generation has a problem with beta-lactamase resistance. So as we know, the beta-lactamases like to destroy the beta-lactam ring and right here at this bond. So if you look at this first generation, you can predict that the beta-lactamase will have a very easy job to destroy this bond because it's very unprotected. So we can already predict first generation are not going to be beta-lactamase resistant. If we look here at the second generation, which has this very bulky side chain, which nicely protects the beta-lactam ring, we can figure out that here the beta-lactamases might have a lot of trouble to get in there because here's this bond that can be destroyed and this is very well protected now. And indeed, so the second generations are beta-lactamase resistant. If you look at here in our family at the daughter and the son, this little kids, they are even smaller and the side chain definitely is not going to protect from beta-lactamases. So both of them are not resistant to beta-lactamases. What else can we learn when we look at these molecules? The next question that we can ask is, do they rather work on gram positives or gram negatives? So as we know, the target of beta-lactam antibiotics and therefore also the penicillins are the PBPs, the penicillin binding proteins, or also known as the transpeptidase, this enzyme that is responsible for the cross-linking of the peptidoglycan layers. So where is this enzyme located? And so where do these penicillins need to get to? So these PBPs are located right here in this in a cell membrane, right here. So that means that in order to reach a target, the penicillins need to get through the cell wall to get to the penicillin binding protein. Same for gram negative. So now the major difference is that the gram positive bacteria that have this thick layer of peptidoglycan is like a mesh. So this is not a barrier for drugs. So drugs can easily get through and act at the penicillin binding proteins. Gram-negative bacteria is very different because gram-negative bacteria have, in contrast, this additional outer membrane, which is a lipid bilayer. So that means that hydrophilic molecules like the penicillins cannot just penetrate there through. They need to use the so-called porin channels. And these porin channels are pretty tiny channels that, that let in some hydrophilic molecules and, mo and therefore possibly also our drugs. Keeping that in mind, you can already predict that such a pretty bulky molecule will have no problems to get into the gram-positive bacteria, but will have a lot of trouble to get into gram-negative bacteria. And as a consequence, the gram-positive coverage is pretty good and the gram-negative is pretty, pretty poor. So the next generation, the second generation, was developed in order to fix this problem with the beta-lactamases. And because of this bulky side chain, they are also really resistant against beta-lactamases. But because they are even more bulky, they have really no gram-negative activity. They are still going to get very well into the gram-positive bacteria. So the next, when they came out with the third generation, the real goal was here 
to get finally some gram-negative activity. And so they made really the smaller molecules, these are the kids, that can easily get through this porine channels. And therefore we have now some gram-negative activity and we still have the gram-positive, obviously. But how do we fix the problem of beta-lactamases? So when they developed the third generation, they realized that they're not going to have a molecule here that is resistant against beta-lactamase. But the idea was just to solve this in a different approach. And the idea was to develop another drug that you can give just on top of it that deals with beta-lactamases specifically. And that's our beta-lactamase inhibitors. So you just add them onto the third generation, and then you have still this good gram-negative coverage, not good, but at least some gram-negative coverage, and then you give the beta-lactamase inhibitor on top of it so that you're dealing with the beta-lactamases. And for the fourth generation of penicillin, it's kind of a very similar story. So now the molecule is even more smaller, so we get even more gram-negative bacteria, but obviously still very unprotected here, beta lactamase So you need to give an extra molecule on top of it to deal with the beta lactamases. So remember, the kids need to go with the babysitter, the beta lactamase inhibitor. So let's add on some indications for this different generation of antibiotics. I've indicated here DOC, which stands for drug of choice. So what are they used for? So the first generation penicillins, the so-called natural penicillins, are out since the early 1940s. So you can imagine that most of the bacteria came now up with a plan to be resistant against the natural penicillins, penicillin G and penicillin B. The only bacteria that still didn't come up with a plan to become resistant against the natural penicillin is Treponema pallidum, which is the causative agent of syphilis. So syphilis is still treated with the, with the good old first generation penicillins. So when they developed the second generation, they really wanted to fix this beta lactamase problem. And so one important bacteria is Staph aureus that was always famous for making tons of beta-lactamases. And as the second generation penicillins were really developed against Staph aureus, they are also sometimes referred as anti-staphylococcal penicillins. So the strategy worked very well, so they made this bulky side chain to protect the beta-lactam ring to be destroyed by beta-lactamases and had then a very good agent to treat Staph aureus. Methicillin was the first second generation penicillin that was developed. And as it was so frequently used to treat Staph aureus, Staph aureus came also up with a plan to become resistant against methicillin. And you will hear now the term MRSA a lot of times, and this refers to Staph aureus that became resistant to the second generation penicillins as a prime example, methicillin. Although methicillin is not anymore on the market, it was taken off the market because of some adverse effects, we still have nafcillin, oxacillin, and dicloxacillin. And it's still very frequently used to treat Staph aureus, but obviously only for the MSSA, which stands for methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus, and obviously you cannot use them for MRSA, for methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. So the third generation penicillins are the so-called amino penicillins, and this is amoxicillin and ampicillin. They were really developed to get now some gram-negative activity, and that was also achieved. So these drugs have some activity against gram-negatives, and the ones that you can use them for is Haemophilus influenzae, Escherichia coli, and Proteus mirabilis. And that can be remembered with the initials HEP. So that's kind of the gram-negative coverage that this third generation brings with it. They still are very good in gram-positive coverage, and they are used a lot for streptococci and listeria. So when you add on to a third generation penicillin a beta-lactamase inhibitor, so like clavulanic acid, you're going to even increase the spectrum of activity also regards to the gram-negatives. So instead of HAP, you're also going to have now Neisseria coverage and Klebsiella, which gets you to the so-called HENPEX to remember the gram-negative activity of third-generation penicillins once they are combined with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. 
The fourth generation penicillins, ticarcillin and piperacillin, also are normally given always with a better lactamase inhibitor because again, this is a pretty tiny side chain, so there's no coverage against beta lactamases. So you have to add on the lactamase inhibitor. So the fourth generation was really developed in order to cover one problematic gram-negative bacteria that is Pseudomonas. Therefore, a lot of times this fourth generation penicillin are also referred as anti-pseudomonas penicillins. So with the fourth generation, we're just going to add on top of it a couple of more gram-negative bacteria. As you can see, the gram-negative coverage is even more expanded. So you're still going to have your hand packs, but now in addition, you're also going to have CAPES, which stands for Citrobacter, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, Enterobacter, and Serratia. So remember, with this generation of penicillin, you're always adding on stuff. And this is obviously also true for the gram-positive coverage. So you're going to have also a good coverage of strep and listeria and staph aureus in the fourth generation. So you're never going to lose a activity. So to finish up this video on the penicillins, I just want to mention the two most important side effects of the penicillin, which is hypersensitivity reactions and GI distress. And they are both predictable, because always when you see a sulfur in the molecule, you should know this can cause allergic reactions on a lot of people. And, and those can range from a little rash until an anaphylactic shock. So the other side effect that you see in all of the antibiotics actually is GI distress because the antibiotics are also going to wipe out the flora of your GI system. And as we all know, the flora is very important for the digestion of food, for absorption of nutrients. So whenever those are gone, you're going to have less digestion, less absorption. So there are more molecules in the lumen and so water is going to be sucked up and there and you're going to experience diarrhea. This concludes the video on the penicillins.